from the capital city of Charleston, West Virginia, this is Inside West Virginia Politics with Mark Curtis. Inside West Virginia Politics is brought to you by AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Inside West Virginia Politics. We're going to dissect the West Virginia primary this week. Right now joining me is Professor Robert Rupp. He is a professor of political science and history at West Virginia Wesleyan College. Good to have you back. Glad to be here, but I tell you, we had a campaign without traditional campaigning. This was, I've covered every election, I think, since 1978. Uh, I won't ask you the same question, but we're dating ourselves in here. But I, I've never seen anything like this. We've never had a, a, a worldwide, nationwide pandemic that has changed the primary, moved the primary. We had so many people voting by absentee ballot. I mean, this is, people keep saying, is this the new normal? Well, I, obviously not. Once this passes, we'll probably go back to the way it was. I hope because this was very disjointed. As you said, it not only involved how you campaigned, it also involved who voted and how. The whole, all those absentee ballots being sent out. And meanwhile, the candidates who wanted to meet the voters could not. I'm going to double back to the absentee ballot issue in a moment, but let's talk about the big races. Uh, Jim Justice just going away better than 65% of the vote for uh, renomination as a Republican this time. He ran as a Democrat four years ago. And Ben Salango in a neck and neck race all night long with Stephen Smith, and then in the final, really 30 minutes, just pulling it out. Um, what do you think of this race? How does it shape up for November? Well, I think let's first look at the Republican. Justice became the comeback kid. He was in trouble. He, people wondered, was he a reliable Republican? Uh, would, would he be, is he more interested in, in coaching than governing? There were a lot of liabilities that he had, Mark. But when he took charge, then he, like governors across America, for example, Cuomo, New York, literally talked and acted as if they were leader and directly every day talked to the voters in the state. And it did two things. One is it canceled out his opponent, both two opponents, to get a chance to come in and campaign. And secondly, it made him look very executive, decision-making. Yeah, and that's important in a race where, you're right, he, he, there were a lot of Democrats that don't like Jim Justice because they felt betrayed, and a lot of Republicans say he was never one of us to begin with. But then you get a lot of independents there, and I think a lot of people looked at the race and said, you know, he's managed this crisis very well, but he has the bonus of being on television, radio, and Internet every single day in his briefing, doesn't it? That's a huge advantage. Oh, right. Now, interestingly, as he took away the Republican a campaign a nomination fight you had a real dog fight in the Democratic Party as, as you noted um, Smith came within 10,000 votes of capturing the nomination and literally changing the direction of, of the party what we had here is uh, the Democratic Party mark that for two generations dominated the state is now minority and they're looking for a narrative they're looking for a meaning can the party unify? I mean, you had three distinct factions in this race. I think the Stalling supporters will go for Salango. They're more closely aligned. But, you know, the Smith voters are the more liberal to progressives in the race. We could not set up a better binary. We have a, a uh, community organizer versus a politician. We have an outsider versus an insider. We have a movement person versus a party person. Endorsements or yard signs. It just became two distinct Democrats parties and they're going to have to find some way to unify before November. We have about a minute left in the segment and we'll come back to some other races and issues in our next segment. We got to hear for two two segments this week. The absentee ballots. Uh, are we going to see this is not only a phenomenon here in West Virginia but other states around the country. There's been a great resistance to mail-in voting in this country. Will this knock down the barriers and perhaps lead to mail-in ballots in West Virginia and elsewhere? Yeah Mark let's look at the trend. The trend is we are making it easier and easier for you to vote by, by doing the absentee and doing the ballot. Now this huge comes in of the mail-in votes and it, it's, it, it appears to be working now. It's going to accelerate what is going to be inevitable and that is maybe either voting at home online, but voting has to be made easier.
All right, this is fascinating. We're dissecting the uh, West Virginia primary here in 2020. We have Professor Robert Rupp from West Virginia Wesleyan with us. We'll be back for another segment and talk about some more of the big uh, races after this break. Now, back to Inside West Virginia Politics with Mark Curtis. And welcome back to Inside West Virginia Politics this weekend. We're dissecting and talking about, we're doing the postmortem, I guess That's you would right. say, on the West Virginia primary. The big shocker of the night, the big race of the night. Lieutenant Governor, he is the President of the State Senate, Senator Mitch Carmichael, losing in the primary. He had two Republican challengers. What's the significance of this and why did it happen, maybe? Well, the key thing is the teacher protest movement, and we wondered what would happen. Would, would the protest at the Capitol have an impact politically? And we saw this when literally the teacher-backed candidate, who herself is a teacher, Mark, defeated the, the head of the, of the Senate, Mitch Carmichael. Now, I have it anecdotally, I don't have hard numbers on this, that there was a strategic thing done here that the labor unions, especially the teachers unions, urged a number, a good many teachers, to dif disaffiliate from the Democratic Party so they could vote in the Republican primary and knock off Carmichael. It appears that happened. It appears their tactics were effective. And then they'll switch back for the Democratic Party in November. Right. That's a tactic not just used there in Jackson County, but it's been very common, becoming <laughs> common. Yeah. In, in West Virginia politics, but the key thing, it, it used to be the coal miners or the labor unions. What's the key now? The teacher unions have stepped, they've already been strong, but this is an indication that they will be a powerful political force in the future of West Virginia politics. Do we think this is just related to the two years of two-year straight teacher strikes or the fact that Mitch Carmichael was one of the driving forces behind making West Virginia a right-to-work state, which has now been upheld by the state Supreme Court? Was this payback in many, half of American politics is payback yeah. isn't that people have long memories but in this case it was a dramatic example a historic example when you are able to defeat a very powerful person as you said and in their own primary what were the other big stories of the night? Anything else that really stood out to you? Well, we waited for the Supreme Court. We had unprecedented three seats up that could have changed the balance. But instead, Hutchinson and Armstead, who were appointed, won re-election. So in a sense, it was kind of staying with the same way. There's not a dramatic way. Perhaps the most disturbing thing I find are the negative ads, particularly in the governor. And I think we have to watch that. And maybe the media needs to watch those ads because when you you're poisoning the atmosphere when you're showing only negative ads that are questionable to begin with are you, is it your guess that the, this will give be a very negative gubernatorial race in November if the, if the primary is any end that predictor then I'm very worried about what's going to happen in the fall. The big wild card here is obviously COVID-19. If it continues or we have a second wave, it becomes an issue in the campaign. But if it goes away, does that in some ways hurt Jim Justice? Because now people are going to talk about the economy. They're going to talk about the roads. They're going to talk about the bread and butter issues that are always on the table. And now this crisis is gone. We have to realize that, that the virus coming was like a, a meteor striking. Um, the earth. It just altered everything, including state politics. And that's why it, hopefully it will be go away and we can go back to more, you and I are more used to traditional campaigning. Yeah. But you know, who knows? Yeah, and I know, and I, I do this in my column every week that I write, uh, that it runs nationally. I apologize for bringing politics into the COVID-19 discussion because people are dying. This is a very tragic event. But look, everything in life has consequences. Everything affects what happens in the world of politics. So you can't not discuss it. It may seem unseemly, but it happened and people had to deal with it. And there is a political fallout because of it. And notice it, it affected campaigning. It affected how we vote. It just 
uh, many factors on what we are used to in terms of uh, politics in West Virginia were altered. Oh, our candidates couldn't go door to door and knock and shake hands outside the Kroger. Uh, so much of retail politics got taken away. <laughs> Is Zoom campaigning the new thing? Is that I, I, always going to be a thing? That worries me. For 200 years, I could shake the hand. Now I can't. Yeah, is it Zoom and, and TV ads, and we're never going to be able to fa face the candidate directly unless it's eight feet? Yeah, we're eight feet apart. Social distancing here. I want to thank Professor Robert Rupp from West Virginia Wesling for joining us. You're going to be back here in August. You've written a book about the 1960 West Virginia West primary, a very historic primary that really put John Kennedy on the path of the White House. The big debate with him and Hubert Humphrey here. West Virginia was a key race. His book will be out in November. You'll be back then to talk about it. That's it. Thank Th you. Thanks, Professor. Good to see you as always. We're going to talk more about uh, campaign 2020 coming up. Stay with us on Inside West Virginia Politics. Now back to Inside West Virginia Politics with Mark Curtis. And welcome back this weekend to Inside West Virginia Politics as we continue to dissect the uh, West Virginia primary held this past Tuesday. I want to introduce Secretary of State Mac Warner, Republican of West Virginia. Uh, we'll talk a little politics in a second, but let's talk about how things went Tuesday night. Uh, I was surprised that we got returns so quickly and so completely because your office had warned us it might be a day or two or three before we have results that well, are final. Th th this was an unprecedented election, so none of us knew what we were quite getting into, but I am extremely pleased that the election went gr great. Uh, the results were in most of them that evening. Uh, we're now in that pr time period where I ask for patience and that is to let the process work where the absentee ballots are still coming in uh, from the post office. So canvassing starts on Monday and then middle of next week is when we should have some final results. Yeah, results. I believe approximately 40,000 absentee ballots that were sent out have not been returned. As long as they're a postmark by Tuesday, they'll be counted. And then provisional ballots as well. That, that's exactly right. We had about 10,000 that came in on Monday, about 8,000 on Tuesday, about 3,000 yesterday. So you can see those ballots are coming in, but it is diminishing. And so. I, confident by Monday we will the canvassing will uh, take place and uh, we'll have some good results. It's possible we could have some races flip here. I know the, the uh, Democratic nomination for Attorney General is too close to call. I think separating uh, Sam Petzonk and uh, Isaac Spinagle is about 700 votes and so there are enough out there theoretically to flip that race and maybe some local races too. That's exactly right and we could have as many as 10,000 provisional ballots so they're right right in that number you could have uh, something flip but uh, uh, we'll see. Uh, typically, I don't think the uh, absentee ballots usually change things that much. Uh, whatever the trend is up until that time, but we'll see. It could happen. I know a couple of weeks ago we did a story about people who had sent in their application for an absentee ballot and hadn't gotten uh, them. Did you guys work through that problem, or were there still people we, out there that said, I still never got my ballot? We did. There was no <clears throat> systemic problem. There were onesies and twosies, some issues, and that could be anything from a post office error. It could be a clerk error, but uh, we're looking into that. But uh, no, there was nothing substantial that would cause the outcome to be questioned of any race that I'm aware of. Theoretically, uh, with COVID-19 around, if it still was this in the fall, are you going to run the November election pretty much the same way? Well, what this election showed us is that we could do it. The clerks were determined. They, they worked hard over time, weekends and that sort of thing to get it done. But when you have a, we had about a 35% turnout. When you get a 60 to 70% turnout, which may happen during the general, you just double the, the amount of uh, effort. So uh, let's stand by. The answer is yes. It can work. We showed it can work. It's a lot of extra effort on the clerk's parts. And by the way, great shout out to the clerks. They did a wonderful job. Yeah, 55 clerk's offices in the state. They were very busy. Let's pivot a little bit to politics because your name is on the ballot in November. Uh, you were uncontested. Uh, you, you're renominated for your party, Natalie Tennant, who you defeated two years ago or four years ago, who served two terms prior to you as Secretary of State. She's running against you. She thinks this is uh, a time to make mail-in ballots a permanent option. Your thoughts? 
My thoughts is West Virginia has it right right now. By state code, the application process, the application works well. It tells you there's a live person on the other end, a current address, those types of things. It's in the primary and independent voter gets to choose which ballot they want. You wouldn't have that if you didn't have that application process. So I think West Virginia code right now fits our situation just perfect. So when this is all over, we would go back to not having the mail-in option? That is, there still will always be that uh, absentee ballot uh, application process and so if you have a condition that fits the medical reason then you would still be able to uh, get that absentee ballot. Well, let's talk about another issue. She uh, uh, is at least she's not endorsed the idea of same-day voter registration on election day but she said it ought to be studied it ought to be looked at and a lot of the clerks are for it. What do you say? I'll say not a lot of clerks are for it. Talk to the clerks. The coordination we've had restored the relationship with the clerks and just think about this, how would they handle that in this current situation with all the other work that's going on to try to register people on the same day? There's a reason you cut off that registration a couple weeks ahead of time to give them the time to solidify the lists, uh, the voter lists, get the poll, works, uh, the poll books ready for election day. Again, I think we have it just right here in West Virginia. Not a lot of time, but she's also taken issue with your handling of the mobile voting app. Did you have any problems with it the other night? Is, are you confidence it's secure now because there was a study that showed the old votes app was ne not necessarily secure? Well, uh, it depends on who you listen to. No, we are very confident in the security of the mo mobile voting. It worked great. People from 26 countries, from six continents got to vote. West Virginians in those locations were able to vote because of this. Think of this, the Postal Service did not reach 180 countries during this process. If you're in one of those 180 countries, you would have, you would have been disenfranchised. All right, Secretary of State Mac Warner, Republican West Virginia. He's on the ballot in November. We appreciate you being here. Best of luck to you as this goes forward. We'll be talking. Thank you, always good to be with you, Mark. All right, we're gonna hear from his opponent next here on Inside West Virginia Politics. Don't go away. Now back to Inside West Virginia Politics with Mark Curtis. And welcome back to our final segment this weekend on Inside West Virginia Politics. We continue to talk about the race for Secretary of State here in West Virginia. We've heard from the Republican incumbent, now the challenger, Democrat Natalie Tennant, who held the office for two terms. Good to see you, Natalie. Why do you want to be uh, Secretary of State again? <laughs> It's good to see you too. Thank you, Mark. Um, I think that uh, any indication shows from this election that uh, my forward thinking and my initiatives that I put in place over the last eight years are what's needed to continue to to make voting accessible and make uh, businesses um, be prepared to come back from the COVID and the virus. Uh, when I was Secretary of State, I saved businesses money. I saved taxpayers money and I gave it back to the taxpayers of West Virginia doing that by modernizing and streamlining the the office and really looking for innovative ideas whether it was in the business field or in in voting and that's what I want just like West Virginians want I want to see a West Virginia that welcomes businesses and diversity and respects workers and really embraces innovation and there's so much more that needs to be done that hasn't been done over the last four years in the Secretary of State's office and I'm ready to take that forward well let's talk about some of the issues I mean we we've just had an election an unprecedented election where uh, I believe about 25% of the public mailed in ballots, absentee ballots. Should mail in voting become a permanent part of the landscape in West Virginia? Well, I've been talking about this for months and months and months and saying that we need to prepare for November. I think a couple of things that we can agree on is one, that voters like and want absentee vote by mail. They appreciate it and they embraced it. Two, the county clerks did a, a Herculean job in, in um, conducting these elections. But there's some things that need to be fixed and changed, things that I talked about three months ago that should have been in place for the primary and most certainly should be in place for the November general election. We should make it easier for the clerks by cutting out that process of their having to deal with absentee ballot applications. This election proved that vote by mail, absentee voting, whatever you want 
want to call it, is safe and secure. We saw that when the Pendleton County clerk was able to thwart uh, the, the maliciousness of a mail carrier. We saw that. We've seen that um, when folks say, oh, well, if we just sent people ballots, they'd be all over the place and they'd be out and about. No, they wouldn't. The clerks know where they are and they know in the process where they are. There's actually a picture mark in the Charleston Gazette that shows that um, there are absentee ballot applications that came back because the address wasn't correct. And so we know where the ballots are. They're either with the voter or they're with the county clerk. And so that's why it's so important to look at the process because I talked to, to so many voters on election day, whether they sent me a text or DM'd me or said something to me on social media. They want this, but they want it as efficiently as can happen. And I have those ideas on how you can do that. People will be able to walk into the polling place on election day and register to vote and cast their ballots that day. You know what, that, that is an interesting concept. And I'll tell you this, you know, I was a, a Secretary of State for eight years. I was a national voting rights expert for the last two and a half and three years. And that is the trend that's taking place. And that's why I'm running for Secretary of State again. Because I think that we're talking about the past and we're, and we're trying to, the, the current Secretary of State always says, oh, well, we can't do something. Daggone it, I want us to say why we can do something. And that comes with automatic voter registration that I helped to pass four years ago that has yet to be in place four years later. We should be looking at same day voter registration because how many people wanted to vote and weren't able to vote. We should be looking at ranked choice voting. We should be doing pilot projects for uh, risk limiting audits. So there are so many uh, initiatives and bold ideas that I'm bringing forward that we should be looking at that this current Secretary of State is just not taking advantage of. We have about 45 seconds left. I, I know you were a critic of how he handled the mobile voting app, but he says 180 people voted on the mobile voting act uh, this primary and there were no problems at all. Oh, <laughs> I can't believe that he said that because the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which is a, a highly regarded research institution, said there were vulnerabilities in it. And he cannot secure, and he, he the current Secretary of State, cannot say that the, the, the personal information of those 180 voters who voted is secure. And that's why he's not using it anymore. So, so um, when he talks about election security, unfortunately, he has made West Virginia the la laughing stock of election security. Any national story that you read, any national research that you see points to West Virginia and says, oh, they use this very vulnerable mobile voting app. So that's another reason why I'm running for Secretary of State. All right. Well, we've heard from both candidates. We'll talk right to you again thing. in the fall as well as we get closer to the November election. We want to thank Natalie Tennant, former Democratic Secretary of State, for joining us from our studios at WBOY TV in Clarksburg. Best of luck to you, Natalie. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, and sir. remember, folks, Inside West Virginia Politics is a podcast. Download it from your favorite podcast vendor. We'll be back here next weekend on Inside West Virginia Politics.